Uh, it's my uh, very great privilege to be chairing uh, the last of our panels uh, before the closing panel this afternoon. Um, the aim of this panel is to provide a snapshot of the blue economy. And I've had a couple of people, I realize this is a sophisticated audience, but I've had a couple of people ask me, I think they're probably lawyers, but as a lawyer myself, I think there's no, no indictment, uh, what the blue economy is. So I thought uh, it might be useful to pop up just on the slide a definition provided by the World Bank uh, and the graphic here, uh, just to orient the discussion that we're going to have uh, this afternoon about the blue economy. Um, and it's obviously a concept um, that is designed to encourage the stewardship of ocean or blue resources. Um, and it encompasses a wide range of uh, economic sectors and um, related policies. So aquaculture and fisheries, uh, maritime transport, tourism, uh, waste management, renewable energy, um, biodiversity, food security. Um, and we're going to hear about, in particular, two different areas this afternoon from our panelists. Um, and the first panelist we've got is someone who's actually already presented uh, yesterday. Um, it's Dr. Joanne Fisher, and she's going to talk to us about the future of fisheries. So, welcome. So um, while we're waiting for, for the slides to come up, I, I don't speak without slides. It's just you know, a thing of, I think, many natural scientists. <laughs> we hang and cling on our slides. Um, so what I will present you with is a, a somewhat subjective and selective review of um, literature and also, uh, let's say, much influenced by my personal experience and what I believe is, is, is really important in this context. So with this caveat, just an overview again about where the small islands developing states are mainly located. I think we haven't seen it yet, so there it is. <laughs> well, uh, I think it's uh, uh, interesting to see that they are really almost all in the tropical belt. Um, also, I thought it would be nice to see how they look like. So um, these are examples of uh, small island developing states. And uh, many of them are, uh, you know, just have some volcanoes or so, volcanic active mountains. And then the long or, or not so long coastline around it. Um, they are, as was mentioned already, large ocean states. And what you see here, the little dots are the islands, and the, 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 the light or, or dark blue is the e exclusive economic zone. And just because I thought it was so remarkable, <laughs> here a slide uh, bringing that point home again, and that is that 96.5% uh, of the islands are the small, uh, in average, on average, of the small island developing states are water, sea, ocean, and only 3.5% are land. So you can imagine, judging from that, that oceanic resources and fisheries uh, products are really important for the economies of small island developing states. So here the contribution of fish to animal protein supply in uh, the world, the yellow dots mean that over 20% uh, uh, um, uh, of, of the animal supply is provided by fish products. So when you look at the yellow dots, you can see that many of them are where we know small island developing states to be. Not surprising. Also, um, export in fisheries is an important income for many SIDS. And in the Marshall Islands, uh, uh, it, it, it is uh, said to be over 60% contributing to the GDP in 2013. In other countries, it's not that much, but it is potentially a very important source of income, fisheries. So let's have a look again at the threats. I, I mentioned threats, I think, yesterday. So look at them again, climate change, Warming, acidification, sea level rise, extreme weather events, coastal erosion, human impacts other than those contributing to climate change, 
overfishing, deforestation, habitat destruction, waste and toxic pollution, and nutrient pollution, and then the effects or impacts on the fisheries, also well known to many of us, that's the biodiversity loss, distributional shifts of marine species, coral reef bleaching, habitat loss, and declining fish catches. This is just what I thought was important. There are many more, of course, so if you want to read up on that, please do. Overfishing, it's a serious problem. Um, I found this publication that I thought was, was really interesting, where it uh, said that uh, in small island developing states, up to 50% of catches are lost because of the situation that the species are overfished. Were they not overfished, the catches could be doubled. And I think that this is remarkable. And this is, uh, it said in the same publication, much higher the loss due to overfishing in small island developing states than in all other states of their areas. <laughs> so small island developing states seem to be very vulnerable to this type of overfishing and, and the very harmful consequences from it for the economies. Now, ocean warming will drive fishes polewards. And you see here the red areas are areas where the risk that fish reach the limits, the thermal limits of the distribution, you know, will, um, uh, or, so, so that means it can no longer live there, is very high. Whereas in the darker areas, the bluer areas, this risk is very low. So you can see the highest risk is, of course, in the tropics. I just circled where the small island development states would be, so they are all in the red zone. That is not very nice. Now, it doesn't mean it's hopeless because environment has like a tendency, or the, 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 the ecosystems have a tendency to, 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 to kind of get into balance again. You know? So that means if some fish disappear, there is a likelihood that those that can resist warmth will just become more abundant. So it might be also a matter of shifting of resources that you have different food fishes that you, 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 you will catch. It's not clear how this will evolve. It's, it's, it's all in the future and we don't know. But let's say it's very unlikely that the fishes go and nothing comes to replace them. <laughs> um, so nonetheless, there are some computations of the maximum catch potential. Um, in, 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 in 50 years' time or so. And again, the areas that are red are the, or, or orange are the ones where it is thought that the maximum catch potential will decline. And unfortunately, again, those areas are, uh, our small island developing states are mainly in those areas. So again, uh, uh, threatened more than many others. Right, now um, small island developing states are also home to coral reefs. Again, this is a map showing where most coral reefs occur and I didn't put the circles in, but I know, no, you can put them yourselves and then see that our, that this SIDS are actually where also coral reefs mostly occur in the world. Now warming, we come to the effects, to the impacts of threats Warming and acidification lead to bleaching of corals and to their reduced growth. That means minimizing the recovery of coral reefs after bleaching events. Ocean acidification harms shells and skeletons, all shells and all skeletons. That affects everything that has something, you know, hard in the body to sustain it. That is not good news. All of these animals will be impacted to some way, mostly maybe they will, the shells will be softer, maybe they don't grow that large, things like that might happen to them. And they're less resilient. While rising sea levels, uh, flooding, uh, severe weather events, I, I thought, you know, I, I, I am visual, so here's some pictures so that we can visualize what that really means, especially for small island developing states. And coastal erosion, because of these Severe weather events, of course, that will be more, but also amplified a lot by deforestation. So humans uh, in the small island developing states also have a huge impact to, uh, to, 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 to reduce the amount of land that they have available. Mangrove forests, uh, for example, they provide also shelter and, and food for, for, for fish and for fish larvae. 
So they have a very important role to play in the ecosystems and also to provide more food, uh, uh, food fishes, you could say, fishes for, for people. Um, not only um, uh, 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 safeguarding the coasts against erosion. So these are the distribution of the world's mangrove forests in the year 2000. And again, we see that um, small island developing states are the homes of mangroves in the world. There are some more, but mainly they concentrate in those areas. Now we come to the solutions. Um, or to the adaptation, I should say. Um, there are different types of adaptation uh, described in the literature. There is what is called coping, for example. And uh, coping is described as a short-term reaction to a event that a sudden event that is happening. For example, a hurricane is coming and you are trying to bring everything on high grounds or bury yourself in a hole or whatever you do to uh, prevent the hurricane having a, have a horrible impact on you. Then we have something on a that would uh, safeguard us on a much longer time frame, but which uh, requires more resources and it's called autonomous adaptation. And that means that the coastal population which out without much planning and impact from the government prepares and, and adapts to a changing environment. And finally, we have the plant adaptation, which will, um, would, would mean that you um, allocate more resources, and, uh, but it will have the benefit that with the planning that is provided largely also with the help of the government, you might be able to cope on a much longer time scale, maybe for generations. Well, I'm not going into all the measures, so now I'm just looking at some measures that have been taken or are being advised to be taken so that you can restore fisheries and ensure that fisheries in a changing environment can still uh, be sustained in the future. One thing is to restore mangroves. Mangroves are threatened, so it's very, very, a very concerning thing about uh, uh, that, that mangroves are disappearing. It's mainly because of aquaculture and tourism. So control aquaculture, control tourism, and where the mangroves have already gone, restore them. It's not rocket science. It can be done quite easily. It just has to be emphasized. Another thing is coral reefs. It has been found that the bleaching or the destruction of coral reefs is worse when the coral reefs are not healthy, already impacted by human activities. So by restoring a coral reef and fortifying existing reefs, you can help the coral reefs to grow back. And that has been successful. Also, where fishery, fisheries depend on coral reef fishes, you can provide artificial reef habitats for those fishes. And, then, and, and that has, can be successful. This could be all kinds of hard structures that are sunk in the sea, but it is, there are also some very sophisticated and not very costly devices that can be used to create new reefs and, uh, and therefore habitats for uh, desirable fish. There are other alternatives to capture fisheries. That's aquaculture, but you should be very careful with aquaculture because it can be very damaging and harmful. Um, so aquaculture with herbivorous fish or with plants is being recommended for um, as an alternative to fisheries, not really the shrimp aquaculture and other things that are around. Again, uh, I, I showed this earlier this week, a very simplified diagram of an ecosystem and its component that was, uh, 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 that was done by FIO. So we're not going into the details of that, but just see the four big circles abiotic um, components, biotic components, fishing, and the institutions. And they all interrelate and are driven by different forces, etc. cetera. Sorry. No, you're welcome. This is another way of depicting an ecosystem approach to fisheries. This is, uh, was done, drawn by UNEP, and I just added the aquaculture one that was for, for, uh, forgotten, because it's a very important in, and, and growing uh, economic activity along coasts in many, many countries, including small island developing states. 
So this graph shows the, um, um, the different um, economic activities within coastal environments and also the, the benefits that they would have for, for the communities and the threats to the environment, the possible threats, if you don't manage them well. So I'm not going to go into the details, but just to say that if you want to manage fisheries, you should look at each and every one of them and analyze what it does, and then try to mitigate the damages. One area that is a pet area of mine is the local knowledge and fisheries management. And I do believe that if you do not include local knowledge into fisheries management, you're doomed. You will fail. You know, because scientific knowledge is not there. It's not enough, and we don't have enough scientists, we don't have enough data, so that is what we have. We need to use it. There are many ways of doing it that uh, can be easily explored. Also, uh, fishes management and the decision making should follow an interdisciplinary approach with regard to knowledge and data. And also, uh, the management design and implementation of a management system should provide a space for the exchange of knowledge among the stakeholders. So it's not just asking the stakeholders, the questionnaires. You should provide for what they can discuss among themselves what the issues are and gain some understanding. Right, and the other thing that I mentioned on Monday is the regional cooperation. What are the benefits to coastal states of cooperating in a re on a regional basis with, with other states? So there are incentives provided and also assistance um, with establishing best fisheries management practices. You have a forum to address concerns, issues, and achievements, and a wider forum. People are looking at what you're doing. There is probably, if it's a good management organization, support for capacity development. They provide a sharing area uh, uh, for knowledge and data, and they assist, they can assist with control and monitoring also inside your exclusive economic zone. So let me just summarize what the main role success factors for fisheries management are. And sorry, uh, somehow, okay. Mutual trust, transparency, and fair distribution of the benefits. Also, well-defined user rights. Well-organized, educated, and confident fishers. Fishers' involvement in all management processes. Participatory research and regular exchange with scientists, if possible. Adaptability and flexibility of all parties. A supportive legal and administrative framework. Effective monitoring and enforcement, a really, really important point. Without monitoring, without enforcement, everything is only worth the paper you have written it on. And you are lawyers, you write a lot of papers, you know. <laughs> the, but that is where you are measured upon, it's the results, it's the effectiveness of what you do. It's that part, so a lot of money has to be put into that. And maybe you notice that even though I am a scientist, I do believe that the solutions will not come from science, the solutions will come from, 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 from the people who use the environment, and mostly these people have been using the environment. We've heard that also from the, <laughs> sorry, I never can pronounce your name. Um, Sunil. Uh, Sunil. 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 She said that um, in, in, the, in, in Samoa, they, the, 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 the <laughs> thank you. That in Samoa, you have like this connectedness with nature since many, many generations. And that means that people know a lot about nature and about the loss of nature there. And that can help enormously to adapt when the climate is changing. Because there are case, always cases in the past where things were different. And people have already acquired quite a bit of knowledge of how to adapt to differences. We just have to trust. And so, um, well, and the regional cooperation on fisheries management. So the conclusion that I take is that there is a future for fisheries in small island developing states, but it depends on the implementation of best practices. And again, these are apply the ecosystem approach to fisheries, use the local knowledge of fisheries and ecosystems, involve the stakeholders in fisheries management, restore key habitats, collect data, and promote a flexible and adaptable resource use, 
implement and enforce conservation measures, eliminate harmful subsidies. We should have talked about that. That is still a fact, also in small islands developing states, that fisheries, industrial fisheries, are subsidized. That is wrong. It just, you know, contributes to overfishing. And, and you know, it's like, uh, if, if the fishing is too expensive, if the reward is not there, I think then it should not be an economy that you pursue. Um, and finally, engage in regional cooperation on fisheries. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Joanne. Um, we're going to turn now uh, to the second panelist um, who's going to talk about a different aspect of the blue economy, and that's about uh, sustainable tourism development. So I'd like to invite up uh, Dr. Troy Waterman um, to come and give his presentation. Colleagues, <clears throat> um, good afternoon. Um, first of all, before I start, I wish to acknowledge the assistance given by Center for Small States, Queen Mary University, Wilma Hill for allowing me to be here. Um, it's good to be back, albeit in a different format. Last time it was actually on the screen, <laughs> which wasn't the best experience at all for me, really. Um, I also have a confession. I've been trying to prepare a discussion for you for quite a while now. And even up until when Joanna was giving her presentation, I was still scribbling notes. So just um, forgive me for having to, to refer to my, to my notes. Not necessarily because I was unprepared. But blue economy is such a, a, an amorphous topic that it's quite difficult to capture everything. And I'm trying to be true to the tenor of today's session, really, in terms of giving a snapshot. So I'll try to be brief, but as concise and comprehensive as uh, possible. Now, when we talk about the blue economy, you know, we try to advance the concept of oceans, the marine environment, then being able to derive economic benefit for its constituents. Um, so it deals with a, a, both the established and emerging sectors. So we're talking about, um, in terms of established sectors, capturing fisheries, uh, Johanna was talking about that, including seafood processing, shipping and ports, shipbuilding and repair, offshore oil and gas, marine manufacturing, the list goes on. And these can really be captured or broadly grouped into fisheries, tourism, water pollution, sewage treatment, uh, transport. It covers quite a bit. So you would imagine then the difficulty really in trying to, to, to coalesce everything into a and package it really so that we were able to talk um, fluently, if you will, uh, about um, the blue economy. I'll give you some examples as we go on. Nevertheless, the blue economy um, highlights that the sustainable use of the ocean resources can drive economic growth. We've established that. Uh, there are many drivers of this economic growth, given the, the broad categories outlined. And there is an interplay between all of them. Um, some of them are obvious, some not so obvious. Um, but that said, the, the concept should not seduce the thought that the sectors under which the activities can be situated, the impacts that can be created, and the components that evolved are independent. Hardly ever. Um, <clears throat> so what I would do is to examine critically then the concept along the, along the way, then I will highlight some interesting paradoxes of tourism. Um, so focus then would be obviously on tourism, the implications, the multiplier effects, and, and developmental objectives of the blue economy within the context of tourism. <clears throat> All, always mindful of the fact that um, it's difficult to speak of them in isolation. So you will see some reference to, to what Joanna has been saying. You'll see some reference to what has been said in the past two days that we've been here, actually, and even in terms of the week too. So, <clears throat> we have to speak about the ancillary outputs and the inputs, really. And, and forgive me, I'm trying not to be academic here. Um, so, bear with me. Um, 
so you have, we're looking at legislative elements, we're looking at policies, we're looking at infrastructure, we're looking at structural and or behavioral remedies, we're looking at facilitators, again the list goes on. Now, these all lend to the maximization of economic potential um, and is an integrated process of economic growth, environmental development, social well-being, but it's difficult because of the inevitable conflicts over the philosophical approaches, um, the socioeconomic priorities, the environmental issues that we have to contend with really when we speak about the blue economy. So, philosophical approaches. <clears throat> and these will likely dictate then how the environment is viewed, how it is treated, and ultimately how it is managed. Catherine would have spoken quite a bit about that too, and, and it touches quite a bit on, on what she's been saying along with, with Theresa. Now, there are three paradigms, if you will, um, about um, the philosophical approaches to environmental man management. So, the dominant social paradigm, um, it prioritizes economic growth while accepting the risk that of environment, environmental change on the premise that in, in time, science will be able to remedy the, the, the impacts, yeah? There's some, there's some people that think, there's, there are some people that think along those lines. Now you have the new environmental paradigm, so it supports the concept of carrying capacity, and then it questions the ability of humans to really understand natural processes, and certainly in terms of engaging with nature. And then you have the, the extreme, I, I would say, the ethic of instrumentalism which is the Earth's resources are solely for the use and pleasure of humans. Yeah. Now, there are obvious conflicts where it, where it is concerned in terms of the philosophical approaches. And certainly you have conflicts too in terms of the socioeconomic principles and the environmental issues. So then, given the fact that tourism has a number of multiplier effects, and despite the fact then that the Caribbean ocean economies are expected to be driven primarily by the growth of tourism, fisheries, ports, renewable energy, there are a number of challenges to consider. So consider the cruise industry. Now, cruise tourism is expected to increase, um, and the fact that we are broadening the Panama Canal now means that you'll have increased traffic. It means then that you'll have to have infrastructure in, in place in terms of the ports, really, to accommodate larger vessels. It means then you have higher frequency of vessels, so it means then that the, the receiving ports would have to be able to accommodate this. We have the established hubs in Trinidad, Jamaica, and I think in Bahamas. But then what happens to these smaller countries? Yeah? So there's going to be an issue where that's concerned. It's either that they have to pretty much come up on board, really, in terms of, and forgive the pun, um, come on board, really, in terms of um, getting the facilities in place, attracting traffic, or it means then that they have to do it all. And that has its implications as well. Now, <clears throat> in terms of improving infra infrastructure, you have to consider new technology. So, for, for example, I'm, I'm working on a project now that looks at the use of ship-to-shore technology in the cruise industry. And what this really means is that you, when, when a cruise ship ports, um, it continues to run its motors. So you have issues really on sea, and I'll get to that, um, more on that later. But then when you get to port, you still have the engines running. Obviously, you have to generate electricity, you have to support, service the, the needs and the requirements of the, the, the passengers that re opt to remain on board. So what the, 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 the research is looking at is how do we supplement that? Rather than have the ships continue to run their engines, we supply that electricity. So it means then that we have to have infrastructure in place then to connect to the grid. That here introduces then the whole concept of renewable energy. Rather than using, relying on fossil fuels, then we can perhaps use wind, solar to, to provide the power. But it means then that in some instances, you have to retrofit the ships to be able to um, log on to, to, the, to the grid. But even so, the return on investment is not as convincing. We have a situation, and this, 
my, my, as, as an artifact really of, of how business is done, if you will, um, in the Caribbean where the arrangements that are made with the cruise line companies are done independently and not necessarily as a block. So you have the individual countries then negotiating contracts with the cruise liners and obviously then at huge concessionary rates to the point where in some instances you don't even get anything, right? On top of that, you have a situation where, yes, you have increased port calls, you have increased uh, volume of tourists, but then the spend that you're looking for, it doesn't happen. So you, you, they come, um, you go on, on, on island, you, you perhaps walk around. Well, in some instances, they opt not to take taxis, so the taxi operators are up in arms because they're at the port waiting for you and you opt to walk past them. So again, you see the, the social conflicts there as well. So then it is a hard sell, really, to convince the authorities and the Port Authority to have infrastructure in place to accommodate this, especially when you're talking about ship-to-shore technology. But the feasibility study is there. It shows it can work, but it's just a matter of operationalizing that technology all within the context of the blue economy, all within the context of economic growth. Now, <clears throat> you have competition for resources, and I'm still within the topic of the cruise industry. So yes, you have, um, with increased port calls, increased volumes of tourists, it means then that the density of tourists at the resource is going to increase. You're going to conflict with locals. You're going to conflict with other users or other usages of the, the resource, and that in itself is a problem. Yeah? Let's talk about marine transport now that we're on the topic of cruise lines. Now, we have, and this, this is a phenomenon as well documented too in terms of the, the ballast uh, from shipping and the fact that it can introduce exotic or foreign species into coastal regions. And I suspect that that might have been one of the reasons for the introduction of a number of diseases we had in, in, in the region um, related to um, reef fish. We have, we know, we're now grappling with the, the whole issue of the, um, the introduction of the lionfish, which is a predatory fish and is essentially a predator of reef fish, which means then if it is a predator of the reef fish, there's a feed-on mechanism in terms of the reef fish not being able to, to support, support or supply reef, reefs in the region. So you see the, the feed map mechanisms there. Now, <clears throat> All this is, is, is compounded by, by the whole issue of climate change. But before I get there, I'll touch briefly on, uh, a bit on fisheries. I don't want to labor too much on that, but just some information for you to, to, to consider. Um, <clears throat> more than 40% of the fish consumed in the Caribbean is imported, believe it or not. Yeah? Now, is it's been documented that the, 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 the increased demand um, is driven by tourism, but I, I'm not too sure about that. I have my al alternative views, and some of it could be cultural as well. Um, and it, again, it, is, it stems from tourism. So and I'll, I'll, I'll touch on this um, a little later as well, but you have the reality where pressures currently threaten fish stocks and the productive capacity and we've spoken about overfishing as well. So to the point where it's, it's been recorded that about 60% of the fish species in the Caribbean are overfished. Yeah? Um, but then, again, I'm revisiting, revisiting the cultural antecedents to this. So it's not a case where well, I've observed that it's not all fish that are overfished. There's some fish that are overfished. And the some fish that are overfished are the fish that are preferred. And what happens is that you have other species that can be fished, um, but they're overlooked because you're familiar with the particular species, and as a result, then you tend, obviously, to, to fish that. If you catch others, you probably throw them away. There are instances where only recently, in the last month or so, we had um, big headlines, or oh, plenty of fish in the fish market, nobody's buying. But what is, what is the fish? It's a fish that nobody knows about, and they're not familiar with it. And so you, you see that with flying fish in particular. Flying fish is a delicacy of Barbados, so you find everybody's buying and eating flying fish. And the other fish, not so much, right? 
It's not to say that you, can, you have an export market, but again, you have to generate that interest. And if you're trying to sell the fish that is already overexploited, then it makes no sense in some instances. What's happening too is that with, with the overfishing, you, you tend to find that the fishermen are going further and further away from shore, spending longer at sea, and that has its implications too, um, even in terms of um, conflicts with our neighbors. I, I was um, discussing with Ambassador Charles only the other day about the fact that we have right now uh, conflict with, our, with Trinidad in, in terms of Barbadian fishermen actually getting arrested in, in Trinidadian waters fishing for flying fish. The dispute hasn't been resolved, but we, we've kind of agreed that the dispute not, not, is not necessarily over the fact that men of Bayesian fishermen are fishing in Trinidadian waters, but it's a matter of establishing what we refer to as the, the maritime boundary delimitation. The distance between Barbados and Trinidad is 300 kilometers. That's about 206, 330 some kilometers, 206 miles. Remember the um, the EEZ, the, economic, the exclusive economic zone is 200 miles, so you know there's overlap there. That's only going to be a result, at least the, the speed at which it is resolved, I believe, is going to be driven largely by oil, and I'll, I'll tell you why. <coughs> now, we, um, we talk about climate change. Um, and, and that's been a, a major focus of, of the session so far. And the effects on migratory patterns of fish. We, we mentioned sargasm seaweed. And yes, we, we understand now the importance of it, but try telling that to a tourist, for example. And, I, and um, Calvin, your, your question was, was, was very, very relevant. We have such an influx of, of sargasm seaweed now that it was, it was interesting to note that British Airways actually issued an advisory to its passengers about the fact that there is sargasm seaweed on the beaches in the region. Yeah? Now, you have an issue, at least it's a, it's a dilemma on the part of governments because they don't know what to do with it. We've had hotels taking the initiative and importing a boom, trying to get the, the seaweed, prevent the seaweed from coming to shore. That didn't work, so they're getting a bigger boom. Um, you're trying to harvest the seaweed, but you don't know what to do with it once it's, harvest, it's harvested. Um, you have the seaweed that does come to shore. You, you're, you're trying now to, to stockpile it, essentially. So here it is. You have rudimentary um, approaches now. We, we've actually had to engage our military to help with this. So imagine seeing a group of soldiers on the beach raking hand, tarpaulins, and they're raking up. See, we putting them in, 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 um, in on tarpaulins along with sand, which is another issue because then you're removing sand from the beach, um, and tr and sending it by the truckload, which I suspect is going to the dump. Now we've had, it's, it's a good thing in the sense that we now have a minister responsible for the blue economy, first of its of its kind in, in Barbados, and I dare say in the region, but he doesn't know what to do either. So is a, is there are options. Or can we use it as fertilizer? Can we use it as feedstock? Can we use it as, as, as an energy source? But it means then that you have, still have to have the infrastructure in place to accommodate that. So we, we're in a catch-22 situation there where we, we have a lot of stuff. We know potentially what we can do with it, but we don't know how to do it. Yeah? <clears throat> so consider also when we're talking about, about climate change, 25% of the population and a significant proportion of the industries and businesses and business activity is concentrated within the two kilo, kilo, kilometer zone inward of the coastline. Yeah? These account for about a billion US dollars in, in properties. Consider also that the urban corridor extends the entire length of the south and the west coast, includes the capital, Bridgetown, major institutions, which would be the loan hospital, government headquarters, Port Authority, police, treasury, central bank, hotels, 
In addition to that, more than 60% of the population reside within the urban corridor. Uh, so we're talking about sea level rise here and the impacts. So the impact is not just going to be minor. Huh? We're talking about widespread. Now, of the 90% of the hotels that are located within the urban corridor, within the, 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 um, the zone that I'm talking about, around 70% um, of these hotels are located less than 250 meters from the high water mark. So it means then um, there's, a, there's a common saying within the industry that tourism destroys the object of its desire, in the sense that the environment, obviously. And it means then that if the hotels too, and this is a, just a, a side point, if the hotels are located within the urban corridor, it means then that you, you will have conflict. Um, conflict with, again, residents. But, but consider, step, step back a, a little bit from that and, and consider also that it has implications really in terms of property values. So you realize that there's a price gradient now. We've recognized this a price gradient um, along the course because as, as you get closer to the, the, the course, prices increase. It means then that people are forced in some instances to move inward. And there's a, a it, it's, it's, it's a funny, but yeah, it's quite a serious scenario that we have where we have, in, in terms of the West Coast, we have the Platinum Coast, we, so called, it's, it's just um, in, in, informally called that Platinum Coast. You have properties that are upward of in, in three million pounds, some instances, and you have the Gold Coast. Now, what happened is that, and then we have Sandy Lane. Uh, I don't know how many of you are, are familiar with Sandlin, but Sandlin is the top, uni um, I almost say university, the top um, hotel in Barbados, quite expensive, quite exclusive. There's a golf course attached to that. And what happened is as the developers expanded, they were buying the properties as they expanded, but there were some people that refused to budge. So you have a situation where you have a golf course and then you have three houses dotted on it. And the, and the owners refuse to budge on the basis that, well, this is my family home. So what they've come with, to an agreement with Sandy Lane, Sandy Lane is going to maintain their properties. They're not going to confuse um, the, the developers, and that's it. And it's worked so far with them, but then you have other situations where people have opted because you know, the, the, the properties now are coming at a premium. In some instances, more than 100 times the, the going rate uh, per square foot um, for the property you, the, own, the developers are willing to pay. So you do have that migration, dislocation in some instances of, of um, the population. Now I spoke a little bit before about cruise line and the, the technology that's there in terms of ship to shore technology, with the option of using renewable energy. But this is another paradox that is, is quite fascinating. Now global oil, oil prices, as you know, are quite fickle. So what the governments had, had decided to do is, listen, we have to find alternative means of, of energy so that we can have at least some level of independence from fossil fuels. Now, some Caribbean countries have, have set targets in terms of renewable energy penetration. So you have Aruba, for example. Their, their targets are 100% uh, renewable energy by the year 2020. St. Vincent. 60% by 2030, St. Lucia 30%, and Barbados around 65%. So, and, and this is influenced, and, and, and I'm encouraged by this, um, is influenced largely by the decrease in, in the cost of renewable energy technologies, and then there's a corresponding increase in investment in the area. So you then have the option of, you know, geothermal, you have wave energy, you have solar, so the, the, the options are there. But the Caribbean now has an estimated 126 billion barrels of oil, 679 trillion cubic feet of natural gas still to be explored and, and extracted. So guess what's going to happen? Added to that, there was a major um, oil and gas discovery in Guyana. So, get, well, obviously, you have increased investments in fossil fuel um, in Jamaica and Bahamas, and the other um, Caribbean countries now are, are courting investors now in terms of extra exploring and extracting oil. So the whole, the whole concept of re energy independence um, 
has gone through the window. How do you reconcile that? How, how, can, how do I tell a country that is still on the, on, on the, on, on the drive for economic um, resilience that you have to forego oil because you said so? Yeah? <clears throat> so there's still a lot to be done then to advance the blue economy given the, the numerous paradoxes that occur. And I haven't touched on the fact that um, the majority of the hotels are foreign owned, so there, there are economic leakages through the repatriation of funds to, to the home country. Um, and then there was a question to, um, from our colleague in Fiji about the fact, and she touched on this too, the fact that the hotels are foreign owned, so then it creates problems too in terms of arbitration as well. <coughs> so you have a number of themes then um, that are extracted, and I'll try to be quick here. So you have one, sustainable and inclusive gro growth of development um, as one of the, the, the drivers to focus on, but then there's, a, there's an issue. There's evidence of sectoral biases. Um, you have, um, in terms of water scarcity, you have the golf courses are lush and green, but the government is asking locals to ration water. Yeah? <coughs> You have the whole dilemma between economic development and environmental management. You have coastal pollution. And, and then let's, let's revisit cruise ships. You have the transboundary impacts now, because it's estimated that cruise ships generate about 200,000 gallons of sewage in a week. So essentially, the sewage also becomes tourist um, in the sense that you have the, the uh, and there's suspic suspicions that the sewage is not treated adequately by the hotels. You have some hotels that have package treatment plants as well, but those are not monitored, which is another issue because you have, you have the legislation in place, but enforcement and monitoring is, is abs are absent. Um, you have, in terms of tool driver, uh, reducing the risk of overexploitation and, and risky measures of extraction of ocean resources, but you do have the evidence of overfishing, uh, the, the new plans for prospecting and exploration for oil. Three, enhance welfare of coastal communities with respect to economic opportunities and social protection. But you have conflicts over traditional users of the resource. You have a culturation of host population uh, because you do have situations now where the, the lifestyle of the tourist then is, is, is aspirational on the part of the locals, so they aspire then to adopt um, behaviors uh, and what's like from um, displayed by the the, um, the tourists. So this leads to the a typical touristic culture that we talk about. And a, a classic example would be the spring break phenomenon. Yeah, spring break, everything goes, anything goes, and that's it. And you see that creeping in now into into Barbados and certainly into other other um, destinations. So what happens then is you have the social cultural um, attributes of the host country um, become artifa artifacts of marketing campaigns. So yes, we, 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 we promote um, cultural activities, but again, this is for a particular reason, and this is really to attract um, tourists. Um, <clears throat> but then on the flip side of that, then you have, because you have the affluence of tourists, then it creates xenophilia again, and, this, uh, and it goes back to the whole issue of, of um, adopting or, or um, foreign cultures. Believe it or not, Hall Halloween is now a feature in, in Barbados. Huh? Um, so for ensuring the resilience of countries to natural disasters and impact of climate change. But then you have unregulated or poorly regulated coastal construction. It continues. You have ad hoc coastal defenses being constructed by um, property owners come engineers. Um, you have agricultural land being repurposed for golf courses. There was a, a window to the C group. Really, what happens is that you could take a, and this is even before my time, um, you could take a, 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 a drive, a Sunday drive along the coast, um, along the major highway, and you would actually see the sea, and it was all nice and stuff like that. Almost there. And now it's been obstructed by properties, or what have you. So having said all of that, and, and 
mindful of the fact that I'm trying to be loyal to, to, the, to the program. Um, a number of barriers to, of, to the Caribbean, really, in terms of the blue economy strategy. So you have failure of legislation to address issues. So, but I'm also mindful that legislation should not be seen as a panacea. Um, but again, we, we have to start somewhere. There's failure of legislation then to allow for effective enforcement. So agencies are unable to use their powers to effectively address conduct. And there's a lack of data. And in some instances, there's a case where you, you don't know what to do with the data. Yeah, and that's another issue. And then there's a lack of full economic and environmental appraisal of projects. So the whole issue of e um, environmental impact assist, um, assessments, the, the, the objectives of them are lost. Because what, what a major component of the EA is for, the, is for public consultation. But what happens is that public consultation comes after the document has been prepared um, and signed off. Yeah? So it, it becomes just a, a matter of tokenism in some instances. You have conflicting priorities. Um, and just quickly, I'll give you an example. You have a uh, government built a 12-foot wide um, road cut. Cut a 12-foot wide road one mile in. And this is in the last standing mangrove swamp in Barbados. Overlaid it with sand and boulders to, 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 to reinforce it. They also destroyed, in the process, uh, red and white mangroves. They also cleared um, the area to provide access to the Graham, uh, to, for a Graham Hall nature sanctuary, believe it or not. And on top of that, then the South Coast Sewage so Plant is located next to it. And the, the outfall, the emergency outfall, actually goes into the swamp. Did I mention that we are also signatory to the Ramsar Convention yeah. <clears throat> for wetlands? So then you have issues with in, inadequate coordination of policy. You have concurrent jurisdictions. So you have five agencies um, responsible for coastal resources, but none of them have explicit jurisdiction. So that creates a problem in itself. And then you have the empty rhetoric. And this is my very last point. Um, I, 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 and, and this is really is last in the sense that is, is polemic, is political, is, is provocative, and is also personal. The Caribbean Development Bank published their, um, their document, Financing the Blue Economy. And a part of it states, um, a, strategy, a strategy that forays into new growth sectors and expands existing ones in a sustainable manner will facilitate faster economic growth and can usher in a new Caribbean economic development paradigm that is more diversified and less vulnerable to external shocks. Sounds very much like the green economy in terms of the object, objectives as well. So we're just introducing, it seems, and this is the cynic in me now, we're introducing a, we're repackaging it, an old concept, into new packaging and hoping then that we'll get change and I'm a little skeptical that we'll, we'll see any success with us going. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you.